Good evening, everyone. This open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the Arlington Redevelopment Board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So I will take a quick roll call of all of the members of the board. Uh, Ken Lau. Uh, yes, I'm here. David Watson. Present. Eugene Benson. Present. Katie Levine Einstein. Here. And Rachel Zemberry, the chair, I am here as well. I'll also run through the staff members uh, from the Department of Planning who are joining us. We have Jenny Raitt. Here. And Aaron Zwerko. Here. Do we have any other members uh, from, the, from the planning board who are with us tonight? Okay. Nobody else from the department. Great. So the subject of tonight's, uh, tonight's meeting is to open the uh, warrant article public hearings for the 2020 special town meeting. Tonight is uh, the first of three nights of hearings. Uh, the second will be on Monday the 26th, the third on Wednesday the 28th, for a total of six warrant articles. Uh, consistent with, the, with past uh, hearings, the Arlington Redevelopment Board will be hearing from the applicants and the public wishing to speak on each of the, these articles as scheduled. The board will pose only the questions, only questions tonight to the applicants, but will reserve discussion and voting on each of the articles until the last night of the hearings, which is on Wednesday the 28th. So I just want to run through a few items for any uh, person wishing to speak at, the, uh, at these open public hearings. Uh, any person wishing to speak at the zoning warrant article public hearings will be given an opportunity to do so in accordance with the following procedures. The subject matter of the hearings is posted in the agenda, which you see on the screen. People wishing to address the Arlington Redevelopment Board on the subject matter of the agenda item shall signify their desire to speak by raising their hand when the chair announces consideration of such item. To raise your hand in Zoom on your computer, Go to the participants section at the bottom of your screen and select raise hand or on your phone, press star six to unmute yourself. After being recognized to speak by the chair, such persons will preface their comments by giving their first and last name and their street address. Any person addressing the board on the subject matter of the agenda item shall limit their remarks to three minutes and may be allowed to speak more than once at the discretion of the chair. The board may receive any oral or written evidence, but such evidence is restricted to the subject matter of the agenda item. Immaterial or unduly repetitious evidence may be excluded. Persons present at the public hearing are requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made or actions taken at such hearing. Hearing participants shall refrain from interrupting other speakers and conduct themselves in a civil and courteous manner. Speakers should address questions through the chair. Speakers shall not attempt to engage in debate or dialogue with the Arlington Redevelopment Board members or other hearing participants. Questions may or may not be answered during the public hearing tonight. All right, with those procedural items out of the way, we will uh, begin with the first article on our agenda, Article 20, which is a zoning bylaw amendment uh, with parking reductions in the B3 and B5 districts. And I will turn this over to uh, Jenny Raitt, who uh, is going to speak on behalf of the planning department. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm Jennifer Raitt, I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for the town. And 
this is a warrant article that was actually had a hearing. Um, our, our one and only hearing on March 2nd um, included this, uh, this particular item as well as others, but we did have a, a pretty um, a, a back and forth discussion about it. I did, however, update the memo that was provided back in March to provide a little additional information. So I'll, I'll explain this article. The article emerged as a result of a, um, a case, uh, a docket that was under review by the Redevelopment Board um, for a restaurant to go into a former store that was located in Arlington Heights on Massachusetts Avenue. The, um, the issue was that there's no parking tied to that building whatsoever and that the applicant at the time was unable to find a way to create parking or utilize any other existing parking in the immediate neighborhood in order to fulfill the parking requirement. However, the board was placed in a position where we were unable to set the number uh, lower than what we are allowed to reduce parking from uh, in the, based upon what's allowed in the zoning bylaw. And it put us in a position of having to refer the matter, make the decision for the environmental design review special permit, but defer the matter of parking to the Zoning Board of Appeals as in the form of a variance, which was eventually granted to this particular petitioner, but flagged and, and, and long after the time that we had um, our hearings. But I think in general, this flagged for the board and the Department of Planning and Community Development, the matter of when you're talking about new use changes or any other uh, development in particular, um, having to comply with our parking regulations and requirements in these particular districts is very challenging. And then on top of it, the burden of meeting what is required for a variance uh, through the Zoning Board of Appeals is next to impossible. Um, incredibly challenging to just create new parking in places where um, the parcels are very small and very, um, it would be very challenging to accommodate a variety of uses on that site. And, and further, um, would run counter to a lot of the town's economic development goals. Um, so, you know, I think the, the challenge here is, do we want to accommodate our lots with new parking as opposed to other uses? Because when we do that, when we try to set the requirements for everything, we run into the problem of re recognizing that to provide for all of the parking ends up saturating most of the small uh, developable lots along Massachusetts Avenue, uh, which is primarily where we're talking about B3 and B B5. Um, further, I think we're trying to encourage vehicle reduction, use reduction, and it fits the long-term goals of the town to consider how to address this matter. Um, second matter is that we already encourage transportation demand management plans as part of most of the EDR special permit reviews. And I think that this can neatly fit into what we already have as a process and a structure for how to consider um, alternatives to vehicle usage. Um, and of course, ultimately reduce vehicle miles travel, which is part of the town's overall uh, net zero plan goals, actually. Um, and then the last item is that it's consistent with our master plan in, in multiple ways. Um, but the primary way is back to the one that I said in the beginning. It fulfills the town's economic development goals in order to better accommodate new businesses coming in and providing in, it in a manner that allows them to do so without waiting months for a variance to be filed and adopted and passed by multiple boards. So um, with that, what I'm showing on the screen is a map of uh, Arlington Center and also a smaller map of Arlington Heights. I'm glad for the board's uh, use. I can bring up the, the text of the, of the uh, warrant article or anything else that would be helpful for the dialogue as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, as we already had a hearing on this item, I will uh, move through the roll call for the, the board before turning it over to the public for any, um, any questions or, or comments. Um, so if there are any any new comments that we that we didn't address previously, I'll I'll start with uh, uh, Katie since you are joining us and we're not at that first hearing. Um, and I can't say that I, I watched what happened at the first hearing, so I apologize yeah. if any of this is repetition. Um, I just want to say I, I strongly support this. Um, 
it seems like we need to, particularly in this moment, but also consistent with our master plan, be doing a lot to make it um, easier for businesses to open and do things to streamline um, our zoning to make this possible. So this seems well thought out, um, carefully considered, no doubt in part because my board members, I'm sure, asked amazing questions back in March and had a great discussion over this, so. Thank you. Uh, Jean. I agree with uh, Jenny's very nice and comprehensive discussion of this and with what Katie had to say. And as Jenny mentioned, the board considered this some time ago and thought it was appropriate and even necessary for the reasons that Jenny stated. I'll just add that many of the current businesses do not have parking. And so when a um, storefront becomes vacant, you don't want it to remain vacant simply because there's no parking available for a new business to go in. So this is one of the many ways to help remedy uh, vacancies in the commercial properties. So I think this is necessary and appropriate. Thanks. Thank you, Jean. Uh, David? Uh, I also uh, agree with the reasoning laid out by Jenny and with my colleagues' comments. Uh, the three business areas currently work pretty well um, with the amount of parking that's available and uh, by removing or reducing the burden of finding parking uh, as businesses turn over, I, I think it'll contribute to uh, improving uh, the, the vibrancy and uh, the occupancy rates of the commercial properties. So I, I remain in favor of this. Thank you, and Ken. I have no questions. I uh, echo my uh, fellow board members' uh, support of this and thank Jenny for her um, um, complete uh, explanation of what, what's going on here. So I'm, I'm all set. Great. Thank you all. So with that, we will turn, we will open this to for public comment. Um, as a reminder, please use the raise hand function uh, at the bottom of your screen and I'll remind you to please state your name and address for the record and then you will have three minutes for any of your comments. Uh, first person to speak is Chris Loretti. Thank you Madam Chair, Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Um, first I want to preface my comments by saying I don't actually see any proposed vote here so I'm not exactly sure what I'm commenting on because all we have is, is a, war a general warrant article with no specific language for zoning bylaw changes. Um, but I would say, I think the staff from planning um, that you received is misleading because in situations that were described, the bylaw does not require new on-site parking. The way um, parking has traditionally been handled in these districts is that even though there is no parking right now for the existing use, if that use changes, then it has been considered a pre-existing non-conforming use. And as long as the new use does not require more parking, then there has been no need for additional parking and no need for on-street parking, I mean off-street parking, to be created. So first, I want to get that out of the way. Um, also, I think the example in the memo you received is misleading because it talks about a change of use and the need to create all this new um, parking off site, but that would, but as I said, what's only needed is any incremental parking requirements. And in fact, the bylaw already provides quite a bit of flexibility for meeting those requirements. Um, I think it's notable that at most you came up with maybe three or four variances over a 50 year period in three different business districts. That tells me that we're doing pretty well as is, and particularly in the past when the, um, the flexibility mechanisms were, mechanisms were much more limited. So uh, frankly, I'm not sure I really see, see the need for this. Also, I don't know why it's limited to just the B3 and B5 zoning districts. And a lot of the other business zoning districts, I would say there's probably a, a greater problem with parking than in the places like the center where you have public parking lots. Also, I think you need to consider that in these, in these districts, you're also allowing residential uses. 
So what this bylaw change would, you, would allow is somebody to come in and put a big apartment building in and say, oh, sorry, we can't have any parking. Um, so, you know, we want you to allow a residential development with zero parking. And I don't think that's appropriate. And I don't think it's appropriate because you also have to consider the other existing businesses and their need for on-street parking. If, you, if these developments are not providing off-street parking, either on their site or elsewhere, then they're competing with other businesses. And I don't think it's fair to the existing businesses to give that uh, competition. With respect to that development in Arlington Heights, they did not need a variance. They didn't need the variance because they found alternative parking that, you, that could be that's, shared. It's time, if you could wrap up, please. So all I wanna say is I think this really needs more study. I would ask you to put it off until you look at the problem in greater context bring more of the businesses in to get their perspective because they're gonna be the ones who are hurt by this. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker, uh, the next speaker from the public is uh, Darcy Devney. Am I muted now? You're all set. Great, thank you. Um, what I wanted to talk about, I had two comments first, which was cars, don't melt away just because you hope that they do. You, you know, it's environmentally sure it would be great and all those other reasons it would be great, but just wishing or forcing doesn't really work. And we can see that already because, uh, you know, what Dan Dunn said is is that the, the most he ever hears about is parking. That is the most contentious issue. Um, and I'm not even gonna talk about snow, but, the overnight parking requests currently go to the select board. So how are you going to make sure that this bylaw doesn't result in people asking for overnight parking waivers and those being granted? Because you've got, you've got the parking going through sort of two different official answers. Um, the big thing I wanted to talk about is I am a member of the Arlington Disability Commission and um, in effect, the current bylaw already changes the ratio of HP, handicapped placard parking spaces, to non-HP spaces, um, and not in a good way. And this was something that we had mentioned when this bylaw was changed in the first place, um, that it was gonna be a problem, and now it definitely has been a problem. And it's a problem in other towns. I work with the Commission of, um, uh, Commission of Disabilities Alliance people, and we just discussed it at our last meeting because a lot of towns are doing this and there's no real transportation demand management system that can work this out. So really what happens is, you know, a housing development that has a hundred two bedroom units would ordinarily have to have 150 spaces. Therefore the MAAB would require that five of those spaces be HP under the way we're doing it already in Arlington, they'd only have to have 38 spaces, in which case they only have two HP spaces. So that's not, we're not clear what would be the best option. You know, the Disability Commission was, was considering doing a separate warrant article for this um, because it's unclear exactly how we're going to work it, but it worries me that we're just pushing through these bylaws without thinking about the fact that they kind of get around the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board and the ADA regulations because they go straight by a ratio um, and once you've once you've reduced the amount of parking whole parking spaces since it's done as a ratio you have automatically reduced the number of HP spaces Given the silver tsunami in Massachusetts and especially in Arlington, we are going to need more HP spaces, not less. So I am truly concerned that this bylaw again ignores it and in fact makes the problem that we're already having with the reduce it by 75% to- I'm, I'm sorry, we're, we're at time if you could wrap up, please. That's it. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thanks. Do you have any other members of the public wishing to speak? Seeing none, I will turn it back to the board to see if there are any, um, any additional questions or comments before we move on to the next article. 
Yes, I have one. Please. I, I mean, just to make sure that people were clear what the proposal is, and um, Jenny put, just put it up on the screen, I guess some people hadn't scrolled down far enough, is we do have the proposed change to the bylaw, and it is only for businesses, it's not for residential. So I, I don't know if that completely um, eliminates some of the problems that were mentioned, but it's not an intention to do residential. And it's not something that would reduce the amount of parking that's currently being used, but just recognize the limitations that exist. That's just what I wanted to say. Thank you, Jean. I'll also add that it is one, it is added as an option, not as, um, as one of the potential options that the board may consider in addition to the other uh, requirements already included within section 6.1.5. Uh, any other items from, from the board before we move to article 16? Seeing none, uh, we will move to the next item on our agenda, which is article 16, uh, zoning bylaw amendments and the definition related to open space. Uh, this article is to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw by renaming the terms open space, open space usable, and open space landscaped in section two definitions or take any action related thereto. Um, so before we, uh, Jenny um, Rate will be uh, speaking a bit on this, but before we do so, I wanted to make sure that the petitioner, Steve Revlak, is with us this evening. Uh, hello, Madam Chair. I am here. Wonderful. Thank you. So, Jenny, I'll turn it over to you before we uh, turn it over to Steve. I'll just say a few brief, brief things. The, the first one is that, and these are also in my memo to the, to the board and what's been posted in the Novus agenda, but just briefly. Um, it's the, I think the intention, and we'll hear more about it, is to neutralize some of the terms around open space um, and that the word yard um, which is a word that actually the board has been using pretty consistently in the four and a half years I've been working with the town. Um, we often refer to it as a yard um, in the back of a building um, and uh, that it's, it's specifying sort of the, the way the land is actually being used on the lot. So it's consistent with this board, but it's also consistent with some of the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, cases as well. Um, it is, the scope is limited to definitions, but we observed in our review that it might be relevant to make some other amendments in the bylaw that might, however, be out of scope. Um, the last item is that the master plan talks about promoting ways to make the zoning bylaw just simply more usable and understandable, especially when it comes to terminology and what different definitions mean. Um, we worked very hard, actually, <laughs> on definitions during the recodification process to uh, sort of tease out what is actually the definition of board versus how you actually uh, calculate things and measurements, et cetera, the dimensional requirements. Um, this would kind of create even further teasing out and definition of the concept of open space, which of course is, is more than a concept, but the way that we look at it and talk about it, I think this is meant to introduce a term that is frankly often used uh, by boards in their decision-making. Um, so that, that covers the, the highlights of the memo that I provided to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, I will turn it over to Steve Revelak. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is Steve Revelak, and I live at 111 Sunnyside Avenue, and I'm the petitioner for Article 16. So um, Article 16 proposes to change the terms open space, open space usable, and open space landscaped. It does not propose to change the definitions. Uh, and neither does it propose to change any of the associated regulations. So we're just, we're just renaming defined terms in the bylaw itself. I had two motivations for bringing this article forward. One was that our bylaw uses the words open space in two different contexts, and in each of those contexts, they have a different meaning. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And secondly, is just because, frankly, I've gone to enough hearings and seen enough people misunderstand the definitions um, that it makes me think that, you know, the, the people don't 
when people say open space, they're not necessarily speaking in a way that's consistent with what the text of the definitions are. So with respect to the way that we use open space, those words in the bylaw, uh, we have an open space district, which is, you know, under the jurisdictions of the Park and Recreation Commission, the Conservation Commission, you know, it's under the jurisdiction of a public body, and its principal use is open space and recreation, and any structures in the open space district are clearly accessory to that. You know, for all practical, for, to a large extent, it's what you would call green space. Now, the open space that is used in the second way we use open space is as a dimensional and density regulation. Now we have three definitions uh, in, in this context. One is open space, uh, one is open space usable, and one is open space landscaped. The latter two have specific uh, quantitative requirements associated with them, and the definition of open space just sort of sets a framing for the other two. So the way we define open space is a yard, including sidewalks, swimming pools, terraced areas, decks, patios, play courts, and playground facilities not devoted to streets, driveways, off-street parking, or loading spaces, or other paved areas. So the fact that, you know, we, the definition for open space begins by calling it a yard uh, is what got, led me to think uh, that yard space would be a more uh, appropriate term and possibly better understood. Now, with respect to the difference between landscaped and usable open space, you know, in general, usable open space, uh, it's the, you know, its primary characteristic is a, is a set of requirements. So it need, needs to be, have a, hor a, a certain horizontal, minimum horizontal dimension, you know, 25 feet or 20 feet for recently constructed uh, residential houses with, that provide surface parking. But, you know, there's a minimum parking require or minimum parking requirement, a minimum, you know, area size requirement, a minimum dimensional requirement, and open space landscaped is for the most part, you know, the areas of the yard that are left. Now, um, since open space usable is generally the biggest portion of the yard, uh, I had suggested calling it open space primary or just primary open space. And for landscape, that tends to be the smaller area. It has a smaller dimensional requirement as a percentage of gross floor area. So I had suggested calling that secondary. Um, I am you know, completely open to better ideas for the terms, um, but I just you know, wanted to you know, bring this forward as a way to, uh, I think, try to clear up some of the language and hopefully to improve usability. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revlak. I uh, will open um, discussion now uh, through roll call for the members of the board, um, starting with uh, Katie. Um, so I, um, I think this is great. I think um, moving us in a direction, um, you know, as the memo from the planning department indicated, moving us in a direction where the terminology we use is more comprehensible to the general public, I think is great as a step forward to making um, zoning and land use more inclusive to a wider audience. Um, and so obviously we need to be really careful with the language we use to make sure that we're being precise in the concepts we're defining. Um, but this seems to me like um, a modest administrative change that would help support the goal of um, making the zoning bylaws more accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jean. Um, thank you. And thank you, Steve, for putting this forward and for your explanation. And it's certainly understandable. And in reading your explanation, if I understood it right, one of your motivations for this change is distinguish these sorts of open space from the open space zone itself, which is parks and, and recreational areas and things like that. Um, that said, I have, a, I have a few concerns about the terminology you're proposing and I'd like to suggest an alternative to you. Um, I have some concerns around primary and secondary because they tend to be seen not simply as what's larger and what's smaller, sometimes what's more or what's less important. And sometimes 
um, landscape open space may actually be a larger part of a parcel than usable open space. So I'm somewhat concerned about that terminology. I'm also somewhat concerned about using yard space as the term, because as you can see from the usable open space definition, it now allows it to include um, an open area accessible and used by occupants located on a roof, or um, um, I think somewhere else it might say a, um, a balcony or something like that. So it, it creates this inconsistency with yard space that includes um, a roof. What I would suggest instead of these for your consideration of consideration of my colleagues, based upon what I understand Steve's um, concern about differentiating this from open space zoning, is, is to not call them open space yard space, but to call it private open space, uh, private landscaped open space, and um, private usable open space, so that we wouldn't get rid of the open space, but we would define it at was, as what it really is, private, as opposed to public. So that's one way I would like to, uh, Steve and my colleagues to consider redoing this a little bit. The other part, and I, and I think Jenny mentioned this, and I'm not sure what the answer to this is, the warrant article itself just talks about amending the definition, not amending, but renaming. But we would then have to go through, and, and I took a quick run and I ran out of time to number it, but there are probably 40, 50, 60 places, not in section two, where we would have to rename the open space to whatever it's become. And I'm not clear whether we can do that under the bylaw that just renames section two or not. We may want to ask town council about that piece of it. But if we, if, and if we can't do it, then I think we would need to think about doing this the next time when the uh, warrant article gives us the ability to not only rename in the definitions, but also in the other section. If we can do it, I'm fine with it, but not with Steve's terminology, but with the terminology I suggested for the reasons I suggested. That's it. Thank you, Jean. Did you, uh, Jenny, did you want to address um, Jean's question or, or we'll follow up with town council? Oh, I would want to follow up with town council. Great. It's a good question. Um, we, it's a question that we I, I embedded in my memo, but we'll follow up with him about it. Great, thank you. Um, Ken. No, I concur with Gene uh, in uh, what he said. Um, as a principle of just uh, clarifying the name, I think that's a great idea, Steve. Uh, but I think, um, we, uh, what Jean said was is correct, and that's all the comment I have. Thank you, Ken. David. Jean stole my comment. Uh, I, if I understand correctly, what Steve is is driving at here, and and I understand his concern because I've I've observed it as well. He really is trying to make a distinction between public and private open space. And um, the language that's been suggested, um, I, I don't think really gets at that. Um, and um, I, I personally find it potentially confusing in a different way from, from the language that we have today. Um, so I'm, I'm not in favor of moving forward with the proposed language, but if we wanted to examine uh, the public-private distinction more explicitly, I would be in favor of that. Um, I, I similarly um, have a question about whether um, we can actually accomplish the change within scope of this warrant article. And then the only other thing I wanted to say is um, the, these terms, landscaped open space and usable open space, um, are terms of art. Um, 
and widely used in, in zoning in many, many communities. And I, I think we want to be very careful about changing them um, because we, we certainly don't want to cause confusion uh, among people who uh, may be working across multiple communities and they come across Arlington and we don't have anything called open space anymore uh, in, the, in the way that they're uh, used to seeing it in, in the zoning bylaws. So I, I think we should be cautious about changing these terms. Um, but I do think um, it would be helpful to distinguish between public and private. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Steve, I see that you have your hand up. I'll uh, see if you would like to respond to any of those comments before we open this up for public comment. Uh, yes, I would. I would like to respond to Mr. Benson's comment. I think that uh, private open space, private open space landscaped, and private open space usable would be, um, I think it's a great suggestion. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Cambridge uses the term private open space in their zoning laws. And as several of the board members have noted, you know, uh, and I didn't in my opening remarks, but one of the distinctions between the two ways we use open space is the district is really public property for public use and the dimensional open space is private property for private use. So I think, I think private is, is, a, is a great way to frame it. Thank you, Steve. Um, any other comments from the board before we open this up for public comment? Jean. I'll try not to steal David's ideas anymore. There. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we will, with that, we will open this up for public comment. Please, um, as a reminder, use the raised hand function in, uh, in Zoom. And I will take the uh, comments in the order in which they are seen. Please remember to state your name and your address, and you'll be limited to three minutes. Uh, the first is uh, John Warden. Well, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. I, I, I was always a little challenged by this technology. I'm so glad when, when we get to real meetings with real people in a real room. John, uh, John Word in 27 Jason Street. Um, it, it seems to me that this uh, proposal, um, never mind the, the, uh, the, the uh, ramifications that it might have throughout the various parts of the bylaw is a solution in search of a problem. And open space is something I think everybody can understand. Certainly we can understand we have enough of it in Arlington. Uh, and open space in a park is open space in a park. We know that. Open space in my backyard. So I, I don't see any point in complicating things and uh, bringing in a new definition that has been pointed out is used anyplace else. Let's just stick with what we have. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, the next speaker from the public will be Patricia Warden. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes, Patricia Warden, um, 27 Jason Street, Precinct 8. Um, I just want to say that this could almost be an attempt to distract and confuse from the existing fairly clear descriptive um, descri description of open space as we understand it today and could be provide um, an article in which, uh, like last year, Mr. Ravelar uh, had an article in which uh, he didn't even vote for his own article in the end, and he tried to hang a lot of other unrelated um, matters that were very important onto his article. I think this article could be damaging and confusing for town meeting and others, and could certainly be damaging for our very precious open space. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. Uh, the next speaker uh, will be Carl Wagner. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road, Arlington. Uh, I think it's, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's important that uh, just like changes to the bylaw were made in the past to make them nominally clearer and better understood, changes like this should also meet that uh, goal. I am pleased that the state appointed member of this uh, commission, of this board, uh, Mr. Watson, pointed that out. I wish the rest of you who are town manager appointed would realize that this is an obfuscation. My understanding of open space private is that it is trees and grass and things that keep buildings small, not because buildings need to grow larger, as I suspect Mr. Revelak's goal is, but in fact because they are things that keep people happy on those properties. They keep the town the way it, it is in a good sense. They keep uh, coronavirus at bay, for example, by giving people a place to go. If you call spaces primary and secondary instead of open space usable and open space landscaped, you are simply paving the way. As Mr. Revlak actually points out, if everyone wants to take a look at it in this document, he points out that in the long term, I quote, in the long term, I hope that we can revisit the way our zoning law regulates yards. But for the moment, my goal is to have new terms with that better fit the text of the definitions while leaving the definitions as they currently are. So, folks, there are going to be several more days of hearings. This article looks neutral, but in fact, its goal is to downgrade and devalue open space, green trees, green grass, the space that parking gives to cars, the fact that buildings don't have to be jammed against each other. And I really think we have have to be concerned that there are articles coming from Mr. Revelak and others that want density and urbanization that could be very, very, very dangerous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, the next speaker will be... Uh, the next... Thank you. The next speaker will be uh, Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Uh, several members of the board have really covered most of what I was going to say. So I'll just be brief and get to the end of my comments. Do we really want to burden town meeting with such an article at this time? Consider how it would play out. The petitioner will present his lengthy argument. There'll be two or three town meeting members who will then speak in opposition. And then there'll probably be a few supporters of this article who will speak next. And finally, there will be a vote. All this is easily going to burn up 20, maybe 30 minutes of meeting time. Is it really fair to town meeting to burden them with a, what is really a semantic quibble during such trying times? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. The next uh, speaker will be Chris Loretti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, uh, 56 Adams Street. I, I agree with the previous speakers. I really don't see that this is necessary. And I think the changes Mr. Revelak proposed actually add to confusion. Um, one, and, and indeed, his definition of yard space is just wrong. I have a side yard on my house. It's entirely a driveway, but it doesn't meet his definition of yard space. I, I find that very confusing. Um, I also think that the terms landscaped and usable are far more descriptive than primary and secondary. And as Mr. Um, Benson pointed out, I mean, my dif dictionary defines secondary as less important than. Now that may well reflect uh, Mr. Revelak's opinion, but I don't think that should be codified in the zoning bylaw. And I really don't think the board, board should, should make that change. Um, I would simply um, wanna correct some statements that have been made about whether these changes are even possible under the wording of the warrant article itself. And the person you need to consult with on that is not town council. It's the decision of the town moderator, Mr. Leone. And he's the person you need to speak to about whether these other, all these other changes that uh, Mr. Benson identified can actually even be made. Um, I suggest there's really no need for this. And I'm really disappointed that the board did not put forward its far more important changes that were articles 44 to 47 in the original warrant for the Springtown meeting. But I would ask you to just vote this down. And if you really do feel you have to go ahead with it to adopt Mr. Benson's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loretti. Uh, the next speaker will be Steve Moore. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve Moore, 64 Piedmont Street. 
Uh, I just have a, a small related question. Uh, in, in reading the various language uh, for yard space, secondary, primary, et cetera, I see that sidewalks is included in the, the general definition of yard space. Um, and the distinction, my question is around the distinction of sidewalks. Uh, does that include public sidewalks? That's a question. And because I see that not devoted to streets, driveways, off street parking, public sidewalks would be probably in the not devoted section. And I'm wondering about sidewalks being included generally because that ends up being a lot of square footage that's part of public property. So maybe it's just my lack of understanding, which is probably it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, can someone can someone answer my question? We're we're working on that. Yes, oh, I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna throw that. Um, Jenny, did you want to offer any technical clarification? Well, just the first thing I want to point out is this: the definitions themselves are not being changed. The on the screen, which hopefully you're seeing, this what would be struck struck out and what would be added is um, this is the strikeout and this is the addition. Otherwise, the the definitions don't. Um, there's not a um, you know, rewriting of this. This is already in the zoning bylaw, in other words, just to be right. clear about that. Um, th this is everything in a lot, though, in a lot, in a private property owned lot that we're talking about. So I don't know if that clarifies where the things are, but if there's anything on that lot, which could be any of the things that are covered here, um, the trees, the walkways, all of that driveways, that's all on the private property lot. Okay, I believe I understand. So what threw me was the term streets, and you're saying that would be a private street on a private lot, not a public way or something like that, which is why I was questioning about the sidewalks. So uh, thank you, that answers my question. Looks like Ken is raising his hand though. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. Ken? Yeah, um, Steve, um, I believe that public sidewalks do not count in that calculation. The only spaces that count are with, is within the property line. Um, so um, if there is a private street, that doesn't count here. It has to be within your property line for, for this. That's my belief on this. I, could, I stand corrected if, if someone found it different, but that's how I've done it in the past uh, using area calculations. Of, and I believe Steve was not trying to change any meaning. Uh, of right. what these were so that's what I that's how I believe it is okay Steve thank you that's my that that it's just my edification and thank you very much sure thank you uh, let's see Steve Revelak no I just wanted to uh, offer a clarification yes uh, as as uh, Ms. Rate stated the only changes to the definitions are the strikeouts and the uh, additions in red everything else in a normal font is part of the existing bylaw it's what um, you know it's what we have today and you know it's the per I am not proposing that that be changed thank you Mr. Evelack do we have any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I will turn this back over to the board to see if there are any additional questions or comments before we move on to the next article. Okay, seeing none, we will move on to the next agenda item, which is Article 17, Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Notice of Demolition, Open Foundation Excavation, New Construction or Large Additions. This is to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw in section 3.1.1 B by appending to the end of this section the sentence, no such permit shall be issued until the building inspector finds that the applicant is in compliance with the applicable provisions of the Title VI, Article 7 of the town bylaws or take any action related thereto. So this uh, petitioner is Michael Ruderman. who appears to be with us this evening. Uh, so I will turn this over to Jenny Raitt uh, first before we uh, then uh, allow Michael Ruderman the opportunity to present this article. Great, he's 
he's here too, correct? Okay, great. I just don't see him on my screen yet. Sorry. Um, so this is, I'm, I think this is a very, this is something that relates back to the construction um, control sort of agreement, the good neighbor agreement, as we call it in um, friendly terms, uh, that was actually put into the town bylaw. It was a series of amendments to the town bylaw that then turned into what is now known as this good neighbor agreement. And this basically is the sort of companion to that by putting a statement in the zoning bylaw that makes it clear that those provisions must be adhered to. And I think, I think it's a wise um, addition. Um, it's not typical that we, we've tried to take out some administrative sort of steps and actions that need to be taken from the zoning bylaw when we recodified it in particular. But um, I think that this one is good because it clarifies the action that relates back to the town bylaw um, for the building inspector to take in order to execute this agreement. So I, I think it's, um, I think it is a wise amendment to the zoning bylaw in relationship to these notices. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And with that, we will turn it over to Michael Ruderman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Michael Ruderman of 9 Alton Street. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, I commend your staff support on the memo that they pre prepared for you, which was made available with the online uh, agenda. I couldn't have said it better myself, uh, the summary of, of what this article uh, tries to do. Uh, and I'm sure you've all read it. For the benefit of, of, of the other folks who are attending this meeting, I'll summarize it very briefly. Uh, at the 2017 town meeting, uh, a committee called the Residential Study Group offered uh, an amendment to the zoning bylaw, which would alleviate uh, or, or address many concerns, uh, the most common and frequent concerns that uh, people had raised about the, the, the pace and scale of uh, new development uh, immediately uh, in, in their own neighborhoods. Um, and these complaints uh, generally uh, centered around uh, finding out a little bit in advance, uh, what was what was going to happen? What the hours of construction would be? What the scope? What the scope and the scale of the project was going to be? Uh, it was all about notice and giving notice, and and hence the name, the Good Neighbor Agreement, uh, was, was appended to it uh, as an expression that uh, this was a, a, a an amendment to the bylaw which would place an affirmative responsibility on 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 people seeking seeking to. Uh, construct projects of a certain scale and size, uh, a responsibility, just let the neighborhood know what's going on so that they can understand uh, the scope and scale of the project, if there are going to be any uh, impacts on, on uh, egress and ingress, uh, you know, hours of operation, scale. they'll know who to contact because the neighbor, good neighbor agreement also makes sure that there's a responsible party to, to receive these requests for information. This was reported out by the residential study group in 2017, overwhelmingly adopted by town meeting. A few years later, we, we are at the point where uh, it, it is found to have been um, uh, not thoroughly uh, acknowledged and, and put into practice. And one way that I thought uh, we could do this was to uh, condition um, condition uh, building permits on filing just enough information that the good neighbor agreement had been uh, you know complied with. Uh, so it ties together the town bylaw and the zoning bylaw at this point and lets everyone know that this is a requirement and uh, we, we'd like you to to uh, you know file some information that says so, that says, you've, uh, that says you have uh, complied with this. And I, saw, I thought this was a way to um, you know, bring these two, two parts, uh, the zoning bylaw and the, and the town bylaws together at this point. And uh, I'll pause there for any questions. Thank you very much for that explanation. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll move first to uh, Ken. Sorry about that, I couldn't get myself unmuted. No problem. Um, Mike, is this basically a, a regulation just for the 
uh, building department such that they can't issue uh, a building permit until this until the good neighbors policy is put in place. I mean, essentially, I'm just trying to understand: is that what this is? That's what this is, and that's what the memo to the board. Uh, what well, was uh, you know right on point in 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 highlighting it makes it, it folds the good neighbor agreement into all the other things which someone already has to do to be issued a building permit so, you know as as town meeting voted it into existence and made it a requirement this now puts the issuance of the building permit uh, uh, you know, on top of fulfillment of of that good neighbor agreement, the good neighbor agreement has penalties in it, uh, and I'm seeking to find out if those penalties have have, have ever actually been have been uh, threatened or or, or levied. Uh, but uh, this would be one way to ensure that people are aware of it and and uh, that it is uh, complied with. Okay. I really have no um, objections to this right now. I, I, you know, it's just a um, another uh, clarification of, of, the, of the Good Neighbor Act, and I think this is fine. I supported the Good Neighbor Act before, and I think this is an extension of that. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Katie. I agree. This seems like a really reasonable uh, extension of the Good Neighbor Agreement and ensures that it actually um, operates as town meeting wanted it to. Thank you. Uh, David. Um, I'm not sure that this is strictly necessary. In fact, I'm pretty sure it isn't uh, because in Title VI, Article Seven subsection D, it already requires compliance uh, with all of the Article 7 requirements prior to the issuance of, of a permit. So that said, I think this is simply a cross-reference to that requirement. It doesn't add anything new and uh, as, as far as I see, and I, I don't particularly have any objection to it. I, I just don't feel that it's strictly necessary. Thank you, David. Jean? Well, I could say that David stole my idea to get back to him earlier because I came to the same conclusion. D of Article 7 says, prior to the issuance of a demolition or a building permit or commencing, et cetera, et cetera, the person must comply with all the requirements. And it, goes on to say violators of the bylaw will be subject to a fine of $200 per day upon notification of the building inspector. So I guess one way to look at sort of adding it here is that you then have belt and suspenders, but I'm usually not a fan of belt and suspenders because it, you know if it ever gets sometime in the future, it would be like, how come they put it in the zoning bylaw? It was already in Article 7 what the requirements were. So I'm just wondering, um, Michael Ruderman, do you have any instances you can point to in which um, um, Article 7 has not been complied with and the building inspector nonetheless issued a demolition or a building permit or something like that? So there's a necessity to have both a belt and suspenders approach to this. Thank you, Gene. It's a good point. Um, I am working up my list uh, of, uh, of uh, properties where where uh, we weren't able to find, uh, according to the recollections of the persons in the neighborhood uh, nearby to uh, some of these qualifying projects, that the good neighbor agreement was was put into force. Uh, it'll expand upon a study, I believe, that was done by the planning department in the spring of 2019. And I'll have the exact figures uh, at town meeting. Off the top of my head, I believe uh, that in the spring of 2019, there was a survey done and uh, a certain number of projects were identified as being of the scale and scope that would trigger the good neighbor agreement. The survey of, of the neighbors in, in, in the close proximity to those projects found that 39% uh, of those neighbors uh, 
had received uh, the notices that the Good Neighbor Agreement required, 39% hadn't, the rest couldn't remember. So at least starting from that point, uh, there is uh, improvements to be made, shall we say, in, in um, making the community aware that the Good Neighbor Agreement exists and uh, that it does need to be complied with. I don't look good in belt and suspenders either, uh, okay. but, but I think this is uh, uh, a, a brief enough reference to, to, bring, to bring the two, uh, the, the, two uh, the town bylaw and the zoning bylaw together as one more reminder that yes, the Good Neighbor Agreement does exist and, and uh, the town through town meeting vote expects that it will be acknowledged. So Article 7, the Good Neighbor part, if I, if I can read this directly, was adopted by town meeting on May 1st, 19, uh, 2019, which means it would have probably gone into effect around July of last year. So I'm really interested in not old history because that predates the town meeting vote last year, but between, let's say, approximately July, I'm not sure exactly when the Attorney General would have pr approved it, but you know, let's say July 2019 and now, if there's really evidence for the belt and suspenders piece. So that's one thing I'm curious about because, you know, if, if, if it hasn't been a problem, I don't see the need to add it. There's one other little thing that bothers me about the word in you put in here. And I'm not sure what to do with it. I'm not sure if it's only me or a real problem. Um, but it says no permit shall be issued until the building inspector finds the applicants in compliance with the applicable provisions. But some of those requires prior notice so the applicant can technically never be in compliance with the applicable provisions if they've done some of the things without giving prior notice. One of the nice things about what's in Article 7 is it doesn't have that potential wording defect that's in your article. So I have some concerns about the wording defect. I have some concerns about whether we really need a belt and suspenders thing since this thing has been in effect you know, for approximately a year. So I'm not sure this is a good idea to do at this time, maybe with slightly different wording in the article, a year or two down the road, if it turns out that mm -hmm. there are problems, you know, from, you know, sometime in um, 2019 to a year or two, I'd be more inclined to think this is a good idea. That's where I am at the moment. If you can provide the staff, Michael, with some examples of non-compliance between July 2019 and now, I think that would be really helpful to make your case. I will, uh, and it's a good point. I appreciate your help in 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 shaping the presentation for town meeting, uh, both before two thousand, both before spring of two thousand nineteen, and and up to the present. I'll be happy to um, uh, work on that and uh, bring bring illustrative examples uh, when I speak to it in front of the town meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jean. Oh, if I may correct one one thing, um, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm not sure if someone said that the Good Neighbor Agreement was put into effect in 2019. Uh, it, it has been in effect in, since, uh, ta since 2017. So we do have, have a, a relatively uh, you know, good uh, you know, time span here to look for examples of, of, of how it's been working in the field. Great, thank you for that clarification. And thank Any you for your consideration. Any other questions or comments from the board before we turn this over to public comment? Seeing none, I will ask that uh, anyone wishing to comment on this article, please use the raise hand function. Um, as a reminder, please state your name and address for the record, and you will have three minutes for each comment. Uh, the first person to speak will be Steve Moore. Uh, yes, Steve Moore, 64 Piedmont Street. Thanks. Um, my uh, my issue to do, I, I am a supporter of uh, belt and suspenders in this particular case because um, the good neighbor agreement uh, has been enforced, as mentioned earlier. Um, however, 
as we've discovered with bylaws and changes to bylaws like this, the process of uh, contractors and developers uh, adopting them, first being aware of them and then adopting them into their common practice takes some time. It doesn't always go uh, particularly smoothly. And uh, one of the issues here to do with the belt and suspenders is tree removal, since tree removal is part of site preparation for an awful lot of development work, but it's before it done often before they break ground to, uh, to put foundations in the ground, etc. cetera. Um, one of the issues that often runs afoul of the good neighbor agreement is trees coming down before the neighbor and neighborhood are particularly well informed. Uh, I, I'm a member of the tree committee and we've we run into this uh, situation um, not commonly but it does it does occur and uh, in this case belt and suspenders would remind again developers and contractors that they need to apply uh, comply with the good neighbor agreement aspects to do with trees and other things uh, prior to them them doing certain activities of site prep which don't necessarily involve uh, complete construction beginning uh, commencement. So, so in this case, I think it reinforces that. And uh, the good neighbor agreement goes an awful long way to uh, providing uh, communication between neighbors and the developers about what's going on. And I think an awful lot of uh, bad blood and angst comes from lack of that communication. So anything to strengthen that and adding suspenders to the belt or vice versa, I think is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next person uh, to speak will be Peter Fiore. I, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so I, I actually um, hadn't intended to uh, comment on anything. I just saw Mr. Rudin's article being presented and because the house across the street um, has been demolished and rebuilt and the whole foundation uh, done over, I just was curious to see what, what he was doing. So I actually have one of those good neighbor agreements and uh, this is it right here. So I can give you a little bit of how it's worked for me. Um, it had the contractor's name. Uh, when I realized I didn't get a site plan like I was supposed to, I asked him to send me one. He didn't send it to me. So I'm, I contacted inspection and service. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Could you just state your name and, and at Oh, at I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Peter Fiore, 58 Mott Street. Thank you. Um, so I, the house across the street to 59 has been rebuilt. Uh, I received the good neighbor agreement. It had uh, no site plan. I contacted the contractor. It had his name and phone number. He said he'd send it, he didn't. So I contacted and got the information from inspectional services. I had an issue with the work hours, I contacted the owner. He was not helpful, so I had to contact inspectional services. The great thing about this document is it's an easy reference for a neighbor that, that wants to see that the contractors, the developer, um, follow the bylaws. It's, it's, it's very handy for somebody that doesn't know what they are to just use as a reference list and, 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 and when they contact inspectional services to get it enforced, they know what they're talking about. Um, I was in town meeting for 25 or so years. I've been on various committees, so I kind of knew it anyway. But if you're somebody in town that, for whom you know, zoning is, is, is a foreign language or doesn't understand it, uh, it's, it's really helpful. So I actually support what Mr. Ruderman is saying, and uh, I, I, I think this is good. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I guess, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Thanks. Thank you very much. The uh, next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Uh, I just thought I would clarify some of the dates um, regarding the Good Neighbor Agreement. It was passed in the spring of 2017 going into effect in the fall of 2017. A little after a year after it had been enacted, the residential study group conducted its survey. I think it was sent out uh, very early in 2019. And uh, 
as it was, I, it was, I think was mentioned, it went out to around 1,200 households, I believe, and it had a pretty low response rate, about only 14% of the people bothered to respond to it. And overall, I think out of the 1,280 households, 40 or so recalled getting their good neighbor agreement. Uh, there's more in that if you want to bring up the report itself, which was um, given to the select board in the spring of 2019. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Chris Loretti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chris Loretti, uh, 56 Adams Street. I'd like just to address a couple comments of the board and hopefully allay some fears about um, this particular article. Um, first, with respect to holding up the building permits by putting this in the zoning bylaw, in fact, the text that's already in the town bylaw does exactly that, because what it says is prior to the issuance of a demolition or a building permit or commencing an open foundation excavation or protected tree removal, the applicant shall demonstrate to the satisfaction of the inspector of buildings, blah, 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 that the notice has been made. So this does not add any new requirements in that respect. And if, if that provision of the town bylaw is being complied with, then, um, you know, then it's not an issue with the zoning bylaw either. But one of the um, benefits of putting this into the zoning bylaw, I don't think has been mentioned. And that is that the zoning bylaw empowers people to make a request to the uh, building inspector for enforcement. This is in section 3.1.2. And that says any person may file a written request to the building inspector for enforcement of this bylaw. So by, providing, by putting this provision in the zoning bylaw, it gives people, particularly the neighbors, the ability to you know, request um, the building inspector to, to enforce the bylaw, and he has to respond within 14 days. So essentially all it does is strengthen the requirements that are already there, but it does not impose any new requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other members of the public who wish to offer comment? Okay, seeing none, um, I, I'll just add to, um, just to, to echo what uh, Steve Moore mentioned with regard to tree removal and site prep. Um, I think for those reasons, I, I too would be in favor of, of um, adding this particular amendment to the, to the zoning bylaws, again, just to continue to strengthen the relationship between the Good Neighbor Act as it's currently written and, and the zoning bylaws. Um, does any other member of the board have any additional comment or questions for the uh, petitioner? Yeah, uh, Rachel. Yes, Ken. Uh, I was going to just let it go, but just um, when Steve mentioned earlier uh, about uh, notifying neighbors about cutting down trees and so forth like that, I believe uh, a homeowner can cut down trees within their property as long as they're not doing an, 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 a new construction. Only time they they uh, meet certain requirements is if trees were in the setbacks. Correct. Then they have to get uh, special approval for that uh, prior to cutting the trees down. Correct. So I just want to separate and uh, have an understanding that we're not limiting them uh, people from not able to cut down trees within their own property. It's only if they are redeveloping the property, and then if the tree falls in the setback uh, of the new development. I think that's an important clarification. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments, or clarifications from the board? Okay. Um, that concludes the articles that we will be reviewing this evening. Rachel. Um, Jenny, did you have? Yes. Just uh, Steve Moore. Um, raised his hand again. I don't know I'm if it sorry, was. I'm sorry, I didn't even see that. Thank it's, you. It's very okay. Much. Steve. Yes, go ahead. yes, thank you. I um, I, I wanted to uh, to just respond to the comment just made. You're absolutely right about the setback issue. Um, it, it, setback issue is where the the tree bylaw comes into effect, 
Uh, however, neighbors respond quite strongly to any large trees being taken, particularly large trees being taken down on property. And you're right, the homeowner and landowner is within their rights to do that. Uh, however, the good neighbor policy, again, goes an awful long way to allaying the fears or at least educating the, the butters about what they, you know, what is within the rights of developer to do and what is not. And, and that's, again, any communications like this helps, which is why I was supportive of the whole belt and suspenders idea. But your point is quite well taken about the setback. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, let's see, we have one more comment from uh, Chris Loretti. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I could just add um, one thing related to the um, first article, I think that came up on the reduction of the parking in the B3 and B5 zoning district. Uh, let's see, I think we are, yes, please go ahead. Okay, um, just briefly, now that I've seen the text that is would actually be in the bylaw change, um, I would suggest that if you're going to go forward with something like this, a couple of changes. I think you're going to run into um, apartment operators who claim that they're running a business. And, I, and rather than saying when a business in the B3 or B5 district, I would perhaps say a business use as defined in the bylaw. And I also think you need to make this um, determination of having no ability to create parking at the sole discretion of the redevelopment board or the zoning board of appeals as applicable. Um, as it is right now, I'm afraid you're gonna get into situations where proponents coming before you are gonna make one claim and you're gonna be making, or potentially making another claim. And I suggest that you, know, you craft the language in such a way that it's up to the board's discretion entirely and doesn't give the proponents um, you know, a way of, of, um, of uh, challenging you. I guess that's what I want to say. Anyway, um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further hands raised, I'll close public comment. Um, Jenny, did you have any final items before we uh, take a motion to continue the uh, open, the public hearing to the next meeting date? No, but just to say, um, just to, the pu public comment is technically still open. So if people wanna submit anything in writing um, to me or any other materials, um, because the hearing is covering multiple evenings, um, we can continue to accept any additional uh, feedback from the public. All of the documents are posted on the uh, redevelopment boards page at this point in time, um, including the agenda and the materials for Monday night. We'll be posting the agenda and materials, I think, for next Wednesday night tomorrow. Um, so there's a, I know there's a lot of material to review in a short time, um, but appreciate uh, your uh, efforts in doing so. And of course, during this particular time, and uh, I'm glad to answer any additional questions should they arise. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, so do I hear a, I'd like to hear a, a motion from the board to continue this open public hearing to the next scheduled date of October 26th, 2020. So moved. So, so moved. Second. Thank you. We'll take a roll call for a vote. Uh, Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Dean? Sorry, I forgot to unmute, yes. Thank you, and Katie. Yes. And I am a yes as well. Thank you very much, see you on Monday.